you very much, Jamil. <clears throat> I want to thank the organizers of this session for having us here. Um, having heard my three uh, colleagues give their talks, um, I've decided not to talk about the case for Islamo-Christian civilization. Uh, it's a real good book. Go buy it. Uh, it does deal directly with, with uh, worthless phrases like what went wrong and uh, clash of civilizations and tries to show that they are of uh, very little value in trying to understand things now. Uh, but now it keeps changing and the now we have in, in 2011 is not the now of 2001 when I uh, had the idea for that book. So instead I want to talk about <coughs> the same things that my colleagues have been talking about because we've now heard about the Renaissance and we've heard about the, uh, uh, the, the European uh, era of discovery as it's called. We've heard about Egypt in the 18th century. But one of the most common uh, uh, beliefs about Muslim societies is that they may well have done something good a long time ago, but what have they done for us recently? You know, is there, can, you, can you bring things up to a more recent uh, uh, time frame? Uh, I want to talk about uh, books, because this is the festival book, and because in Islamic, uh, in the Islamic world, there's probably nothing more important as a cultural manifestation over 14 centuries than the production of books, and particularly uh, the dissemination of the Arabic writing system. Because most uh, Americans can't, uh, cannot read the alphabet in Arabic script, it remains a kind of great barrier between, um, between uh, Western peoples and Muslim peoples. Uh, in Turkey, of course, they have adopted the Western uh, Roman script. And when I first went to Turkey in 1965, I recall being in a hotel uh, dining room for breakfast out in eastern Turkey and people discovering that I uh, that I uh, read Arabic, and people would come up to me and say, would you write, my name is such and such, would you write it for me in Arabic script? Because they had never seen their name written in Arabic. And then they would, I would write it for them on a piece of paper, and they would take it across the street to the antique dealer to see whether I did it right. <laughs> but, but it highlighted for me the degree to which changes in communication are, uh, are really, really important uh, historically. And, um, and the barriers that arise when you cannot move from one, uh, one uh, set of uh, videograms to another, you, you cannot move from one script to another, it, it, it produces the sense of alienness or of otherness that reinforces all of the negative uh, stereotypes, and yet you're dealing with something that is uh, absolutely core to the, uh, to the historical culture uh, of the Muslim world. We in the West, um, of course, have our own alphabet. Um, you don't want to read old handwritings or old uh, German script or things like that because our handwritings are not all interchangeable, but then neither are the Arab ones. But one of the things that we're proud about is proud of is the fact that we have printing. So we've had this question of where did printing come from? Where was printing invented? If I did take a show of hands, I think, and I say, well, how many of you believe printing was invented in China? How many people believe it was invented in Egypt? Probably China would win by, uh, like, say, uh, 100 <laughs> percent. But. We have printed uh, materials uh, from the Middle East uh, that are appear apparently just about as early as the earliest printed materials from China. 
they were first uh, noted about 100 years ago in the catalog of a papyrus exhibition in Vienna. And it was simply noted, oh, here are some printed blocks, some block prints. And nobody picked it up. But it was then noted maybe by three or four other scholars down until I happened to find one at the Columbia University Library in the, uh, in the rare book collection. I said, well, what is this? This is a strip of paper 11 inches long and has 111 lines of writing on it. And they're printed. There's absolutely no question what they printed. So that, that was a problem. Could you, have, could you invent printing and have it not be transformative? Because clearly, we think of printing as being transformative. Um, over time, several hundred of these uh, specimens of medieval Islamic printing have appeared. Uh, and um, more will probably appear. But interestingly, there were two verses of poetry widely spread, one from the 10th century and one from the 14th century, that actually talk about the process by which prints get made. And these are block prints of the sort that uh, Professor Hanno was showing, uh, that, that were used for cloth. You know, they're wood block prints, apparently. Those two verses of poetry make it clear that printing was a underworld scam. You got an illiterate who wanted to have an al a, a, a talisman, an amulet, to protect him from the evil forces. And he wanted it written by a holy man. So he said, hey, I'll do one of these up, and then I'll print a hundred copies of it, and I don't need a holy man. I can just sell it because this illiterate can't read it anyway. And um, it apparently it was, a, it was a common con game to, uh, to print this stuff. It doesn't mean that nobody ever thought of using print otherwise, because in fact we have one of the surviving prints of that era is a complete page of a Quran, which makes you wonder, was there a printed Quran at some point? And there are others that appear to be um, possibly official documents. But by and large, uh, the underworld invented printing, and it did not transform society. Did they borrow the printing from the Chinese? The technique is, um, uh, is different for the woodblock prints, somewhat different. But more strikingly, some of the prints, including the one, uh, ones I found at Columbia, <coughs> were printed uh, from metal plates. Uh, apparently, the way it was done was that you took a clay tablet and you inscribed what you wanted to print in it. And this, of course, would be a technique from Mesopotamia that goes back to, to ancient times. To, you know, they know how to prepare a clay tablet to impress a message in. Then you built up a rim of clay around the tablet, and you poured molten tin over it. Then when the tin cooled, you peeled it off, and the message was reversed in, in direction. Then you inked the message, and you printed it on a piece of paper. So you had the idea of, of, um, of printing a whole page, or printing an entire thing. Uh, I'm not going to go into the technical details of it, but these two verses of poetry gave us the word that was used in the underworld. It was not a common Arabic word. Used in the underworld for the print block <coughs> from which these prints were made. And the word uh, apparently is Tarsh. It comes, shows up first in a poem written in Iran, and my, my personal suspicion is that the word is not Tarsh, but Tarch, because the difference between uh, Cha and Sha in Persian does not represent in the Arabic script of that time. Um, <clears throat> the earliest word for a, uh, for a playing card in Europe is tarocco. Um, okay, you take off the O because that's an Italian ending. And then you say, well, if it was tarch, Italians can't print, won't pronounce as a CH if um, it would be pronounced as a cup. So my guess is that it was taroc, and that it comes from 
the Arab world because we know that there are playing cards in the Arab world. And, um, and again, it would fit with the idea of this being a lower class occupation. In any case, what's apparent is that just about the time the Europeans were beginning to print from woodblocks, uh, they had not yet invented movable print, uh, this sort of printing begins to die out in the Muslim world and comes to be a totally forgotten. So until, uh, until recent decades, um, virtually no historians were aware that there ever had been printing in the Muslim world. Now, uh, I'm going to fast forward because this is actually a lesson in the whole history of technology and the way we do it. Uh, history of technology has been largely a Western development. And there's been an interesting characteristic to it that if Westerners invent something, it's a great invention. <coughs> if somebody else invents it and Europeans borrow it, it's a great borrowing. <laughs> um, you, you know, it's sort of, you know, one way you win, the other way you lose. I mean, I, I would, I, it's, it is, uh, it's amazing. So that we'll talk about, oh, the Europeans took the compass from the Chinese, or they took um, uh, the notion of the, um, uh, of the heliocentric universe from, uh, from uh, Muslim astronomers. But what's really important is what did the Europeans do with it? You know, what was their great accomplishment? Uh, because then you, then you can portray the Muslim origins as being, as, as saying, well, they could invent something, they just didn't know what to do with it. What to do with it. So they had no, and, and partly for the reasons that um, uh, uh, Professor Hanna was talking about, that they weren't organized to take advantage of, of things. Uh, whereas uh, the Europeans were, were organized for this sort of thing. So we get movable type printing, actually originally developed in Korea, but apparently no connection between Korea and the European system. And we develop the printing industry in Europe. And it transforms society. There's no disagreement on that. Um, when I was in seventh grade in Rockford, Illinois, um, Every boy was required to spend one semester of junior high school learning how to set type. Um, you know, I still know my way around a, uh, a type cabinet. And the idea was that if you know how to set type, you will never be out of work. <laughs> because, because the history of typesetting, a little bit like the history of of uh, uh, cutting stones for cathedrals, um, there was a guild. Uh, not, maybe not always a formal guild, but it was a skill. And publishers had, uh, they organized the printing of books. And they had the typesetters and they knew how to do the print, uh, the printing press and so forth and so on. And uh, so along with the invention came an organization of labor. Now, we, we happen to associate that organization of labor with free thinking. Uh, you know, printers, publishers are among the great heroes of Western uh, uh, thought and politics because they had this, uh, this entree into the minds of, of people. But then you have an interesting phenomenon which really stands the, our technique of history of technology on its head. That was in the 1790s. Uh, a man named Alois Senefelder uh, discovered that there's a certain type of stone that, um, that you can write on, and uh, ink will adhere to the, to, the, uh, to the writing that you do if it's a kind of a soapy crayon. Um, but it will not adhere to the stone. And this was lithography literally stone writing. Uh, lithography was technically um, not only a great invention, but it was the origin of almost all the printing that we had by the, by the late 19th, say, late, late 19th, early 20th century, photolithography and so forth and so on. It ultimately supplants typesetting. 
but it's extremely slow because <coughs> you have the resistance of an organization of labor that says that you must set type. So the result is that even though uh, you have lithography invented in Europe and artists use it, so we have great artists who make beautiful lithographs, there are no lithograph books. The Europeans resisted the idea that you would write a whole book in lithography. But when you look at the Muslim world, lithograph books are everywhere. <laughs> This is a case where the Muslim world, and I'm talking about everything from Morocco to Indonesia, and it also goes to China and Japan. I mean, it's not just the Muslims, but other people in the world took a European invention and did something with it vastly more important than what the Europeans did with it. Uh, because these lithograph books not only were uh, uh, easier to produce, but they're beautiful because you didn't have to worry about how can I make a tight connection between uh, this letter and that letter that will look good in Arabic. Um, but rather you could simply write in beautiful Arabic script down to the present day. You can do uh, marvelous things without giving up the, uh, uh, you know, the script that has been the hallmark of your, uh, of your civilization. So, what you get is a completely different organization of the print world. Now, you do have publishers who use letterpress printing. The, the Mulak Press in Egypt, for example, was an important one. <clears throat> but by and large, instead of having a lock on printing in the hands of those people who control the typesetting trade, you have a much more open uh, uh, print universe because the technology is uh, does not require the extreme skill and also it's possible for a scribe who has made his living by writing beautiful books now he can continue to do it you don't have that that technological um, disjuncture to go from from handwriting to uh, to typesetting you can simply have handwriting in a, in a manuscript book or you can have handwriting in a lithograph book. Down to the present day, lithograph books are important in the Muslim world. And they never become important in Europe. So here we have a, a case where in the 19th and the 20th century, you have not a, 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 an invention in the Muslim world in terms of the, tech, of the technology, but rather an invention in terms of the use of the technology comparable to the sorts of things that, uh, that used to be thought of as being uniquely European because only the Europeans had the inventiveness and the organization and so forth to make use of these, uh, of these helpful inventions. Um, I might note that there, no one has ever written a history of lithography in the Muslim world. Um, you can find an article here and there uh, because, you know, all of us know who work in this area about lithograph books. But, but the, the recognition that this was a major technological change in communication still has not uh, reached the, the scholarly world. I haven't written a book on it, uh, probably won't. But, <clears throat> but as, I, um, as I think about this, I think about uh, what's going on today. And one of the great questions that gets asked is, um, Facebook and Twitter, or cell phones, or this, that, and the other thing. Um, is this simply a triumph of Western technology? Um, or is it something that, that derives from Western technology, but it is used, it's being used differently? And that the, the mobilization of, uh, of mass opinion by means of these technologies is a, uh, a development of the Muslim world. Because we have not seen that. We have had plenty of, of uh, moments of turmoil uh, in different countries. Uh, you know, velvet revolutions and gardenia revolutions and heaven knows what. 
here and there. But somehow, it's in Tunisia and Egypt that, uh, that there is this technology being deployed in a way that was never anticipated by the inventors of the, inventors of the technology. So uh, this is sort of the segue into the political side of it, because um, in my lifetime, there have been uh, three moments when it has been possible to inject, at least theoretically possible, to inject new understandings into the broad uh, uh, Western conception of the Muslim world. Um, the first two opportunities did not go well. First was the Iranian Revolution. We have no uh, way of guessing what the relations between Islam and uh, the West would be like if the United States had not admitted the Shah of Iran for medical treatment and, there, and the embassy had not been taken in response. It is now universally recognized that the, uh, the embassy personnel specifically said to the Carter administration, if you admit the Shah for treatment, the embassy will be seized, because it had been seized once before. But they were counting on the idea that it will only be seized for a few hours. Mm -hmm. And so you have a miscalculation. And the result is that the possibility of a, uh, of a new political form uh, developing in a way that was not intrinsically at war with the United States, in the way that many people see the Islamic Republic of Iran being at war with the United States, uh, that was a missed opportunity. And instead of getting an, uh, an opening to think about the Muslim world in a different way, we got stereotypes of you know, fanatic uh, Shiite mobs and so forth and so on. The second opportunity, of course, was 9-11. Um, there was a period of two or three months, maybe not that long, when it was not clear whether the United States was going to see 9-11 uh, as a response to bad policies in the United States, or whether it was going to see it as an example of uh, Muslim hatred of the United States. Um, I won't go into the details, but, but it, it, clearly there was, a, there was kind of an inflection point. And we moved <coughs> toward the negative side of it. And we, you know, we started coming up with ideas that now have matured into a really viral Islamophobia that is not warranted either by, uh, by fact or by, um, by anything else, but has just become uh, a part of our reaction to that and a certain uh, universe of fear we live in. And the third moment is now. One of the things that we have grown up with is the idea that um, there's, there's no democracy in the Muslim world because of who they are. Um, you have to be Western to really be, uh, to, to really be democratic. We have heard this <coughs> expressed theoretically by political scientists, but as often as not, we've heard it from rulers in the Middle East. Uh, most recently, General Omar Suleiman in Egypt, who said Egypt, Egyptians are not, are not ready for democracy. Um, Louis XVI didn't think the French were ready for democracy. Um, no one in, a, in an autocracy has ever thought anybody was ready for democracy. <laughs> and yet, uh, this was what we have been hearing from rulers uh, for the last 50 years. Now we're at a moment where you have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people unarmed coming out and saying, we want a free society. And I think for most Americans, this is very, very exciting. But it's being done by people who are not like us in many other ways. And so we say, well, now they're like us because they're, they're asking for freedom, they're asking for rights, they're asking for representation in government. This is what we did back in the 18th century. But what does that imply about our old stereotypes, our old notion that these people aren't ready for it, 
they believe in a backward religion. They are, they are um, uh, irredeemable with respect to, um, uh, to, to the modern world. And I think that we now have a, um, we're at a moment of, of, of indecision. Uh, and oddly enough, Israel is in a moment of indecision too, which makes our indecision real, instead of simply uh, a holding action until Israelis, uh, until it's more or less what to think. Uh, you can cancel that if you wish. Um, but, but the point is, this is a, this is a real moment of indecision. Um, when you have a Saudi king who has sent troops to Bahrain to, keep, to help keep a king in power, uh, who is ruling a majority of people who are oppressed and, uh, and who are really regarded disdainfully, um, do we support that or do we say those people deserve to be free? I don't know how it's going to go. Now, the, the Saudi vote, there's a very heavy Saudi thumb on the, on, on the weight of all international uh, calculations because of the power that the Saudis have. But I'm not sure that the United States this time is, uh, is going to make the wrong decision. I think that if freedom does begin to emerge and this continues, this could be a great um, moment of satisfaction for Americans. And I think it would be the end of the terror upon which we have waged war. Because when you have a terrorist movement that is based on the idea that you can never get your freedom except by uh, assassination and suicide bombing and warfare, jihad, when you have a movement that is based on that, and instead you have people who are getting their freedom uh, simply by demonstrating in vast numbers, uh, if those demonstrations succeed, and if you do get uh, new, new polities, um, Osama bin Laden can retire. Because uh, this, this is the end of that, uh, of that era of which we were visualizing maybe to last for another 100 years. So this is an absolutely crucial moment. And I think that it is a time when, uh, at the crux of the whole thing, is what do we think of people who are other than us? Do we accept old stereotypes? Do we say these people have lived in a state of decline for centuries, that they belong to a religion that looks to the medieval past, blah, 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 all of these things. Do we fall for the Islamophobic uh, caricaturing of the Muslim world, or do we, do we believe our lion eyes and we say, these are people who can stand up for themselves and express their wishes and we should, we should support them, because, and if we do, I think it will change everything, and I hope that we seize this moment in a constructive way. Thank you.